Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. The story. There were times in my career, I remember I was working on, on a serial killer and he'd eluded us and uh, we lost contact. We were just about to arrest him and he vanished. Well, we found him about nine months later living in Adelaide. And I'll never forget, I had to interview this guy. Before I walked in there, I just prayed to the Lord. And in my worst rebellion in the state I was at, when I needed God, I asked for him and he answered me. Hi, I'm Jimmy Colfax. Welcome to The Story. Today we learn about a life that was going in two very different directions. On the one hand, Rod Baker worked as a highly successful detective in New South Wales. While on the other, his marriage was falling apart and he eventually left his wife and kids. We'll find out how God brings about a miraculous healing in his family today on The Story. Rod Baker is chatting with Shelley Scowen. Rod, uh, let's start off with your career. You spent 35 years in the New South Wales Police Force. Yeah, that's correct. I started in uh, 1971 and I retired in 2006. Right, and you're loving retired life now? Uh, Yeah, I just, uh, as most retirees will probably tell you, I don't know how I found the time to go to work with all the work I'm doing at the moment. (laughs) Uh, it just yep. seems to not be enough hours in the day. It's a good way to be then. You're not just sitting right. around twiddling your thumbs. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. Life, is too, uh, life is too exciting to sit around and waste it. Yeah, absolutely. And you are keeping yourself very, very busy these days. We'll get to that soon. But tell us about your time in the police force. You were a, quite a high-ranking detective at the time. Yeah, I retired as a, a detective chief inspector. I was the crime manager of the Lower Hunter Command in the Hunter Valley. Uh, which was one of the top crime commands in the state. Uh, Very high-ranking detective. I was very fortunate. I worked at a very high level in the Drug Enforcement Agency, Uh, worked uh, on strike forces looking at unsolved homicides, serial killers, police corruption. Uh, I, for a period, was on secondment to the New South Wales Crime Commission as a chief investigator there and worked uh, on the side for the Woodrow Commission into Police Corruption. So my career is uh, is many and varied, but the last 28 years was in criminal investigation, uh, which is which is just a tremendous uh, field of work to be to be involved in. Do you reckon it's being glamorised a little bit by all these TV shows? You see them like practically every night of the week as homicide investigations of some sort. Do you think it all gets a bit glamorised, or is it relatively realistic? Uh, most of it is pretty realistic. But the, the, the unrealistic part is just the man hours and the, the blood, sweat and tears that goes into, into the investigations. Mm. And you leave, honestly, there are times you leave your heart and soul in that investigation. Uh, missing children, one of the most heartbreaking investigations you can possibly do is try and solve a, a, a missing child. Uh, they are just, for, for the police officers and all those working, it, it becomes your life and it's just so heartbreaking uh, when either you, you find a result and it's not a good one or you, you can never find where the child ended up. Uh, I think that part of it is, is pretty well overlooked, just the, the psychological effect it does have on the police themselves. Mm, absolutely. Because we, we do take it to heart. We are, we are human. We do our very, very best. Uh, but sometimes our best just doesn't, doesn't get to a result. Well, and that's the thing. That's part of your job is to try and get to a result. And so it would be weighing on your mind the whole time. Um, you know, yeah. what else can I do? Who else can I talk to? How else can I help? Yeah, I still, I still carry cases 40 years ago, mm. uh, you know, that I was working on that were never solved. And I just, I just still wonder, you know, if there was something else we could have done. But anyway, that's, that's part of the, the TV shows that isn't glamorised. Just yeah. The, you know, the the heartache that it does leave the investigators. Yeah. Was it hard to then retire to say, all right, see you later, guys, I'm just going to leave all those cases behind? Uh, Yes and no. Uh, I I had had really 35 years and I was a pretty high-ranking detective when I retired. Uh, I was at a point where I was just burning out. I just really was at my wit's end with a lot of things and some absolutely horrific cases came across my desk 
And I just suddenly started to understand that I'm not handling this real well. Mm. You know, I used to be 10 foot tall and bulletproof. And now I'm starting to realise that maybe I'm not. <laughs> maybe I'm not so tough. Yeah. A- and psychologically, it really started to affect me. And it just got to a point where I just knew it was time. I, you know, I, I knew it was time. Uh, but there are really good detectives and really good police you can just leave it with and you've just got to trust that they'll hopefully try and work as hard as you did. Mm. Rod, let's go back a few years. You were really full on for God in your early years and uh, in your, I guess, early years in the police force as well. Yeah, that's correct. I uh, I, I gave my heart to the Lord at 14 and, and was heavily involved in uh, in a church and became a youth leader and a youth pastor. And then I joined the police at 19 and uh, was able to, within a few years, get transferred back to Newcastle and back to my church. And I was doing a lot of work as an evangelist around the Hunter Valley, uh, preaching at many different churches. And uh, the Lord was using it amazingly. People were getting saved. Every time we, we took a service, people were getting saved. And it was just a, you know, it was a really good time in, in my life. I'd, I'd met an absolutely stunningly beautiful young lady uh, when I worked at the at the police highway patrol in Newcastle, and uh, we ended up getting married and having three gorgeous little boys, uh, and when they were just uh, three, five, and seven, uh, that's when my world started co- to collapse around me. I was uh, I changed roles. I'd gone from the highway patrol into criminal investigation, and with that was a whole change of scenery, a whole change of people you're working with, you're working on. Uh, late nights in clubs and pubs, working with informants. And and uh, in that, I just lost my focus, just lost my, my train of thought. And to cut a very long story short, I ended up having an affair with a, with a lady. And uh, that was the end of my preaching, my teaching. And uh, in fact, I, I don't think I set foot in a church after that. Mm. And uh, it wasn't long after that that my marriage fell apart. And uh, I walked out on the family walked out on the wife and the three little boys and went to live with another lady and of course that didn't work and and then I got transferred to Sydney I went down there virtually as a single man and just virtually lived the life of the prodigal son every time I, I read that story and, and study that story I know what it means I know what it means and and it's uh, I look back in shame really and, and heartbreak at, at the terrible destruction I caused in my family and in my life and in my kids. Mm. And there certainly is that sense of shame. Sorry, Sorry, there certainly is that sense of shame now, I guess, looking back in hindsight and all the rest. At the time, did you have that sense of shame and that sense of grief in what you knew that you were doing? No, I didn't. No, to be honest with you, uh, I I really didn't. I I tried still to be as good a father as I could to the boys, Uh, would take them on holidays when I could, but... My work uh, involved a lot of travel. I was travelling interstate and around the state uh, most of the time and I just got engrossed in my career. I just got engrossed in the police. I got engrossed in me. I became the most important person in my life. Mm -hmm. The Lord had gone. He wasn't important anymore. My family wasn't important. Uh, I virtually became the most important person to me and therefore I was answering to me and, and I was living a life you know, like you wouldn't, you really wouldn't want to know about. Uh, but I just didn't really focus back on the guilt or the shame then. I look back now, but I know I've been forgiven for that. But at the time, no, life was just about me, uh, which was just tragic. I guess the other thing, as you're talking, I'm thinking about some of the words of Pastor Greg Laurie that talks about um, it's the very same people that are sitting there in church thinking, oh, this will never happen to me. I'll never backslide. I'll never make some of these crazy decisions. You're the ones that um, that you, you have really got to watch your back because you're the ones that Satan's got his sights on. And I guess that's certainly the, the case in your story as well. I mean, you were out there preaching, evangelizing, seeing some great fruit, mm. and then just fell and fell and fell. Yeah, so true. Uh, Greg happens to be quite a good friend of mine. I've, I've done a lot of ministry work with Greg Laurie, and, and what he said there is so true. That is such a true statement. You can you can just not understand the attack that is really coming your way until it's come and it's hit you. Mm. Now, now, that's 
that's not that's not to put fear into anybody. You know, the word of God says, "Fear the Lord, resist the devil." We seem to have it the other way around. We seem to fear the devil and resist the Lord, mm. and that's where I sort of was at. Uh, I, I didn't. Uh, I'd let my faith my faith slip. But I still believed in a God who loved me. I still believed in God. In fact, there were times, even in that state, that I was still sharing the gospel with people, believe it or not, uh, even living the life that I was. And, uh, you know, just, I don't think that ever leaves you. And certainly, let me say this, God never leaves you. There, there were times in my career, I remember I was, I was uh, working on, on a serial killer and we'd, we'd, we'd worked on it for, for, for oh, about 12 months and he'd, he'd eluded us and uh, we lost contact. We were just about to arrest him and he vanished. Well, we found him about nine months later living in Adelaide and I had to fly down. I took my, my detective sergeant with me and we flew to Adelaide and uh, it was a circumstantial brief on five long-term unsolved homicides. And I'll never forget, I had to walk into the, the CIB in Adelaide to interview this guy. And I'm thinking, if I really don't get confessions out of this guy, we will probably run a risk. There is a chance at law that we might lose this case because it's circumstantial. Mm -hmm. And i never forget, that before I walked in there, I just, I just prayed to the Lord and just emptied my heart to him that I needed help, I needed him, and he showed up. So in my worst rebellion, in the state I was at, when I needed God, I asked for him, and he answered me. Mm. Uh, God, God is amazing to us. He really is. It says in the Word of God, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And your oh, yeah. story really does have an amazing, happy ending. We're going to come back and hear that very soon. It's amazing how God can just put all those pieces of your life back together. You still have to live with some of the consequences of that. But uh, yeah, some amazing healing has gone on in your life. You're listening to The Story. Today we're hearing Rod Baker share his life journey. Next we'll hear how he and his wife get back together after a 12-year separation. Back with more when we return. The Story. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401 132 888. Hi, I'm Jimmy Colfax. This is The Story. We're continuing with Shelley Scohan chatting with Rod Baker, who was a highly successful detective in New South Wales when basically his marriage and family fell apart. Next, we'll hear the miraculous way God brought them all back together. We were apart for 12 years. And there were, were, were times in that where I really thought, when I go up and pick up the boys, I'm going to have a talk to Lynn and, and see where things could go. But every time that happened, I'd come up and she'd be in a, in a stable relationship with somebody. Uh, but having said that, neither of us remarried. We were actually divorced and neither of us remarried. So there were times, yeah, where I just really had, there was something inside of me that wanted to see if we could reconcile this. And... Mm. Uh, yeah, that that just uh, that was an amazing part of the story too. Where uh, I was working in a, in, in a strike force, the story I told just before the break about the uh, the serial killer we tracked down in Adelaide. Uh, I was the chief investigator on that strike force, and that was when I was working for the uh, New South Wales Crime Commission. Something inside of me just said, "Next time you're home." have a talk to Lynn and, and I know that I now know that was the Holy Spirit and sure enough I went home that next weekend and I just said to my wife or my ex-wife can we talk can we are you doing anything tonight can we just go out and have dinner and to my surprise she said yeah okay let's let's do that so we wow. went down to, to Belmont Yacht Club and just uh, I'll never forget the night I, I know where we sat and I just said to Lynn you know, I've really, really made some mistakes 
is there any chance that we could possibly get back together? Now, by now, the, the, the boys are 15, uh, 17, you know, they're, they're in their, their late teens. And uh, I said, is there a chance we can get back together? And, and again, she just amazed me. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm quite willing to give it a try. Wow. And she said, but things are going to change. There will be a list of things you will do. And believe you me, as men know, when your wife says there is a list of things that you will do, uh, you do them. Yeah. So we then started to work through that process. Now, that was that was a simple thing, but I'm, I'm a detective inspector in, in a major strike force in Sydney, wanting now to come back to Newcastle, which is always the, one of the most sought-after locations in the state, as a senior officer, where there are very few positions. And uh, I just prayed, you know, Lord, if you're in this, help me through this. And uh, I went to see Christine Nixon. Christine was our deputy commissioner. Christine, a lovely lady. She became the chief uh, commissioner of Victoria for many years. I- I've got the utmost respect for Christine. Uh, I went and saw Christine because I knew a I knew person. We were very good friends. And I just explained the story to Christine. And she just said, Rod, leave it with me. Now, the process, that might seem just sort of irrelevant. But when you're going to a mother and saying, you want to go and reconcile to your wife, she thinks about it differently than a policeman would have. If I would have gone to one of the the, the male assistant commissioners, I think I would have got a different answer. But Christine was married. She was a wife. She was a mother. And here I am saying, I want to reconcile to my wife and my children. Two weeks later, I started in Newcastle. Wow. Took two weeks to get a transfer. So, again, I just saw God all over there. Now, ha- has it been a better Rosa since then? Uh, I will honestly say no, uh, because a pattern of behaviour takes a while to break. Not, not that I did anything wrong, but just to re-earn the trust mm-hmm. of my wife, because she had no reason to trust me, and I'd given her no reason to trust me. I had to earn that trust back again and she had to learn to trust me and that just takes time uh, and, and things. You talk about Satan throwing uh, hand grenades at people. He threw some hand grenades at Lynn and I from people that you wouldn't have thought would do it that were just wrong, just lies. But just those deceptions, but we earned that trust with each other and uh, now Lynn and I travel together. We actually are quite open to uh, to being interviewed in churches or, or meetings and we both give our different side of the story and, and we've been doing that now for a while and, and it never ceases to amaze me with some of the things Lynn says in those interviews uh, that I knew I didn't know about and I you know up till that time I didn't know about how things had affected her and and just how she was dealing with the husband walking out on her mm. and then her having to say to her husband Yes, I will take you back. And her side of the story is just amazing. And and the Lord uses that tremendously with marriages. Uh, My wife and I, when we retired, we ran a four-star bed and breakfast here at Newcastle for many years. Uh, We still run it, but it's now a ministry home. We, We take people in that work in the kingdom and we don't charge them. But in that, working the bed and breakfast, the Lord used us amazingly to reconcile marriages through our story. We were able to tell our story to people who were breaking up or, or, or Christians that are separated and just give them hope. And, and we've saved marriage. Or when I say we have, our story and the way the Lord uses it, he's used that amazingly to save many marriages. Uh, I think that's the thing. People want to hear that hope and that you can oh, yeah. still, you know, make good on that promise till death do us part you know you did make that promise however many years beforehand so now's the time to be doing your bit to reconcile with your other half yeah and and it's been a wonderful journey since then uh you know we love each other dearly uh our kids you know praise god our children never got off track wow. they they never they never rebelled they they're all married to lovely christian women have their own children and you look back and I just see God's blessing, not not my teaching them and leading them, but I see God's blessing on my children, the way he's looked after them and, and protected them 
and the way they're now growing and what they're doing with their children. Uh, it's just, you know, we serve the most amazing Heavenly Father that loves us unconditionally, how we are and who we are. Mm. And, and, and one thing he teaches me, I, I share a lot, as I said earlier, uh, before the interview, I've, I've been able to speak in every state in Australia in the last 18 months to men and, and mixed groups. And, and the one thing, with hope, hope is just the most amazing thing. But with hope, we don't live in the past. I, I, I share that all the time. Do not live in the past. Because if you live in the past, if things go wrong, that's where you default to. Uh, we live now and we live with a God who's got a great work for all of us. I don't care who you are or what you do, you have a story. Everyone has a story. And everyone has, has, has a life experience to share with someone that can help them. But if we live in, in our past, I would be hopeless. I would be helpless and hopeless. But the Lord's using me amazingly now and, and I just love it. Would I go through it again to get to this point? Not in a million years. Mm. Uh, if I could have my time again, there is no way in the world I would have walked out on my family. There's no way in the world I would have turned my back on God. But I did. I don't live now with the guilt of that. I'm forgiven. I've been set free. And God has a purpose for my life. No matter how much I rejected him, no matter how rebellious I was, no matter how much of a drunk I was, no matter how much debauch and, and all that I got into, God loves me now. He's forgiven me and he's cleansed me and we don't live in the past. We live for the future. Yeah, absolutely. It's a story of forgiveness from God and from your wife. She's shown you incredible grace and forgiveness in coming back. And even like you were saying, the fact that the boys haven't really strayed from the narrow path is a real credit, I think, especially to her as well for keeping them oh, uh, grounded in all that was, time. She was the most amazing mother. And I, and I share that every time I, I share our story. Lynn was just the most amazing. She never left church. She never left the Lord. She was the most amazing mother to those three boys. And, and I thank the Lord for her, and I thank the Lord for the work she did for my sons. Mm. She, she was an amazing woman, and she is an amazing woman. But, but with forgiveness too, Shelley, I learned to forgive myself. Yeah. I, and that's important. You must learn yeah. to forgive yourself. And, and when you can get to that point, that's when you really start to get set free. Don't and live with the guilt. Don't live with the shame. You forget. And like you say, living for the future rather than living in the past, it's its huge. Absolutely. One thing I appreciate about talking to people like yourself, people that have done something that they're really not proud of, and I mean even the fact that you had to spend a bit of time telling us all about it today, yeah. You're here confessing to your sins and I've talked to other people who are convicted murderers and whatnot and they come and say, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner and I really need God's grace. And, and they have this amazing understanding of the love and grace of God. And I think we all need a slice of that understanding that all of us have sinned. We've all done things that have separated us from God. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just that some of them, you know, seem to rank higher. Some of the sins seem to rank yeah. higher in our own human, you know, ranking system. But we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God and it's yeah. only His forgiveness that has brought us back into that right relationship. Yeah, I, I agree with that totally. We grade sin, God doesn't. Sin is sin in God's eyes, but we put a gradient on it. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, that that is so true. But there is no sin. There is nothing. I, I love Philip Yancey's statement in what's so amazing about grace there's nothing you can do to make god love you more there's nothing you can do to make god love you less mm. and when you've had to to understand and fall on that grace that's when grace becomes real you know you can hear preachers preach on grace you can read books on grace but when it becomes real to you when you know what you've really done and and understand what god's grace is there that's when it really hits home. That's when you understand grace. And God's grace is just amazing. Yes, God's grace truly is amazing. And it's great to see how God healed Rod Baker's marriage after a 12-year separation. A perfect example of how God doesn't give up on us no matter how far we turn away from Him. He's always there to welcome us back and help us pick up the pieces of our broken lives. Good news for all of us. Well, thanks for joining us for this inspirational story. 
I'm Jimmy Colfax, encouraging you to share your story with someone today. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.